And good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to PIP for inviting me to share some of this knowledge with you guys. If I can summarize what I'm going to talk about here is basically what I do when I'm visiting a farmer, when I'm spending some time with a farmer in his farm. Just at this time, I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation and the technology that allow us to gather more people and you know have a conversation that hopefully will help you to get more tools on when, when it comes to coccidiosis management on your farms. So thank you for the invitation. At the end of the presentation, if you have any question, I'll be happy to, to answer. And my email and my phone number will be at the end too, so we can talk about it even after this presentation. <clears throat> so controlling coccidiosis with the use of vaccines on breeders and layers. Coccidiosis, as it is, is a topic that we frequently talk about. And just to show you how important it has been, I just have to go back to the last couple of presentations that has been presented in PIP from my colleague and friend Art and Santen on the big three, coccidiosis being one of them. And also on the necrotic enteritis presentation from Dr. Greg Page, when he showed this slide showing that coccidiosis is a big part of this complex that is necrotic enteritis disease. So coccidiosis is something that is relevant to the industry. Doesn't matter where we are in the world. Doesn't matter what type of weather we have, it's present. And I want to show this as a, an idea that 10 years ago when I was doing my master's degree was discussed about. We are very close to 2025, but this is on broilers. But what it wants to say is what needs to be done to achieve our goal of one to one FCR. And if you see right here below, coccidiosis control is one of the big groups that this author was highlighting on this article. Of course, there's other issues, other ways to approach better efficiency in our animals, but coccidiosis is present as one of the big ones. You might see on the, on the top of the slide, gut integrity, and you hear that it's a topic that will be discussed further and all of these to achieve a better performance on our birds, not only broilers, but you know, layers and breeders as well. So to give you an overview of what coccidiosis is, we need to be press, uh, keep in mind that it's one of those few diseases that we are discussing and working that is not a viral disease or a bacterial disease, it's caused by a parasite, a protozoa to be more specific, from the Imeria species and that affect most of the digestive tract of poultry. <clears throat> you might see uh, how the parasite looks like on one side of the slide when you check on, on the microscope. Coccidiosis is a self-limiting disease. That means that even when you don't intervene, at some point the immune system will fight it back and control it. The important thing is what happens in between. And that's when we have all the tools that we use on our daily basis to control it. It can be clinical or subclinical, being the subclinical really important because sometimes we do not see it as the pictures I'm showing here, but it's causing problems in our performance. The economical global impact is very big. This is aside from 10 years ago, and you can see the numbers about $2.4 billion a year. I don't have numbers for the recent years, but I might suggest that it remains as important as 10 years ago. We, we haven't achieved that point where we control it totally. And this is a statement that I have heard on other coccidiosis presentation, even within Merck, within the company that I work for, that says that coccidiosis is not just a disease of a bird of a flock. So we need to open our minds and, and think that it's not something that I control flock by flock is just a dynamic fluid population of these parasites that live in our barn and that we need to think about not separate per flock, but as a whole and our, what our farm is. <clears throat> With that in mind, uh, 
I want to highlight how the cycle of this parasite works. You might see this graph right here, and you have two components, one that happens outside of the bird and one that happens inside of the animal in the digestive tract. It doesn't matter if we are using a vaccine or if we are using medication, the cycle behaves the same way. If you see here at day zero, we have some oses that are getting ingested. You know, I'm not going to highlight every step of the process, but basically what happens is that those are ingested either naturally or by a vaccine. It has a cycle inside of the animal, but to complete the cycle a week after requires certain conditions. You might see here highlighted the sporulation, which happens outside of the host and requires certain conditions. During this process, it will be a different level of intestinal damage. So the parasite is cycling on the intestinal cells and it, while it cycles, it destroys some of them. What is the goal if I'm using either medication or a vaccination? Basically, I want to reduce the damage that is being caused on this process. And to repeat this statement, sporulation or the infection form happens outside of the host and requires humidity, temperature, and oxygen. Keep in mind those three components because they will be important, especially if we are talking about vaccination, humidity, temperature, and oxygen. When we check COXI inside of a microscope to define what it is, basically what is in the slide here, we have different sizes of imerias or coxy types. They are living in different sites of the intestine and they're causing different type of lesions as well. So if you see in this graph, basically I'm highlighting five of the most important ones. Imeria, Acervolina, Maxima, Tenella, Necatrix and Brunetti. They are very important on long life birds like breeders and layers. And this is the distribution or where they live. And that also tell us where we should look for the lesions when we are doing a necropsy, when you guys are having a veterinarian or someone like me or a big company representative with knowledge to check on into this. This is what we are going to look for to confirm if there's any lesion caused by COXI. On top of that, there's a topic that I will highlight a couple of times, is uh, taking dropping samples, poop samples, to measure oses per gram. Basically, what we will do is to count the number of those parasites in any given areas of the intestine and measure levels of infection. So keep this in mind for some of the future slides. OPG is one of the tools that is more commonly used with necropsy. And it's a tool that should be in our minds as producers every time we have concerns about coccidiosis. When you go out and visit farms, you will see some of the issues every now and then. Uh, I'm showing some pictures here that I have taken some sites from books because they are not as frequent, but you will see some lesions here caused by Imeria cebulina. You, you need to know how normal looks like, but in these particular pictures, you will see that in this duodenum, there are several white dots in the, in the mucous membrane. This is caused by Imeria cebulina. You see these zika lesions. This is a zika full of blood in a young chicken. This is also a very frequent lesion caused by Imeria tenella. And on top of that, you will see bloody droppings in the litter. This is a picture of a couple of lesions called by Emilia Maxima, showing some petechia on the serous membrane on orange mucus on the inside of the intestine. And lastly, an old picture from a book that I have from Emilia Brunetti, when you see some digested blood and thickened rectal walls. Frequently, you will deal with the two first ones. With Maxima, sometimes it's not like it's not present, that it's not causing lesions, but it's mostly subclinical. You might not see it as clear as in these pictures. 
but it's also very relevant, relevant and I'll show you some other examples later on. So to summarize that, basically we're talking about a parasite that is causing destruction of intense intestinal cells, the enterocytes. And this slide is just to show you how that looks in a microscopic level. So this is electronic microscopy and it's showing how the parasite looks like, how the cycle goes inside of the bird and the damage that it causes. So with this, these pictures are basically showing the destruction of the intestinal surface, which in normal cases looks like this with long villi, good patterns. So basically what you need to keep in mind is that the damage that is being caused is going to affect the performance of your flock. Sometimes it's not as evident as a clinical disease, but it will be good enough to affect the way your birds are growing and behaving. So with broilers, you will see that they start getting behind on how fast they're growing on their average daily gain, for instance. With layers, when they're still young, they're basically gaining weight week after week, but you will see that they might slow down or you start seeing some other issues being present. We can discuss those ones further. So we have medication as one of the tools that we are using for coccidiosis and it's a valid tool. It's something that we're still using, but it's been a practice that has been done for a lot of years. And in some cases, we are seeing that resistance is part of the issue or regulations on what medication can be used become part of the limitations to control coccidiosis. So that's when vaccinations comes from. Vaccination cannot be considered as a full solution. It's part of the toolbox. In some cases, it's successful enough to be used by itself. In other cases, it's used in combination with other alternatives. So reading this couple of statements citing two articles, it says that anticoxidials remain as a valuable practice when it's done properly, but in its rotation or combination of products, and nowadays the use of alternatives like vaccination or botanical products. You probably in your farms are using herbal extracts, uh, saponins like yucca extract, uh, oregano, products like that, garlic, that could be part of these solutions that are I'm citing here. Still with the introductions of the coccidiosis vaccines in the early nineties, the strategy changed and it's been changing over the years. As I mentioned, the vaccination can be used alone or as part of a farm program that includes also medication because when you use vaccination, you are restoring the drug sensitivity. You know, if you're having issues with resistance, you repopulate your farm and your barn with a strain coming from a vaccine that is sensitive to drugs. And that's also part of the alternatives that a farmer, a producer can use. And the use of plant products, as I mentioned earlier. In this short video that you've seen right there is the very first step of vaccination, You're basically spraying the chicks in the hatchery on day one. And this is the very beginning of a process that doesn't end up there. So now we're jumping into what vaccination is and how it works. You might see it here. And in some cases, you know, you order some other vaccines in the hatchery and you don't have to really work additionally or be worried about them unless you have to boost them in the farm. But with coccyx is slightly different because this vaccine that it's been applied at this very moment requires your input, your work in the farm level to make it cycle successfully. So this is just the very first step of a process that will tell you will take you four to five weeks to finish. So seven to 21 days is the very first part of providing the conditions for this vaccine to cycle. I mentioned before that we need certain conditions. So coxie coming from the vaccine can sporulate. That means that it's getting activated, if I can use that word. And that's the oxygen, 
available in your barn, the temperature, but also the moisture that you have in your litter. That moisture can be developed by having a good relative humidity on your farm. It can be developed by adding extra moisture in certain areas of your barn so you can improve your, your, your moisture levels in the litter. And that's something especially important in areas where the relative humidity outside is low. So well, I'm speaking from Alberta today and we acknowledge that this province in particular has very, very dry areas where we need this extra input to improve the, the relative humidity inside of the barn so we can get that little moisture that I'm talking about. The oxygen and the temperature are usually there. The moisture component is the one that requires our extra work. So what are our goals when we apply a vaccine? Well, basically we want a development of complete immunity. This by doing a low level exposure to the parasite and an early exposure as early as day one. We want to improve the intestinal health. So reduce the risk of necrotic enteritis. So that's why coxie is part of this big complex of necrotic enteritis. And so we, if we take care of coccidiosis, the risk of NE is reduced. We want to reduce the risk of other diseases like osteomyelitis, among others. And why is that? In summary, is because if you remember that destruction that this parasite can cause in the intestine, that could lead to a good number of challenges in, in the flock, basically because we are destroying or challenging the health of the gut. Part of the goals of vaccination is uniformity. So if we have a flock successfully vaccinated, there will be a lower coefficient of variation in our flock, will be reduced competition. And for layers and breeders, the final goal is more fertile and hatchable eggs or more eggs produced, so more profitable flocks. What we do with coxie during the first weeks is going to impact what happens during the whole rest of the cycle. In this couple of images here, I'm showing another ex example of vaccination doing in a hatchery and the step one doing in a farm, which is a uh, partial brooding in this case. This is a picture from a broiler farm, but the same principle applies for breeders. And the same principle applies, you know, considering the, the differences in the layer industry as well. So if we have cages, we want to promote also having more density. I have paper, for instance, to uh, allow the moisture to stay in the surface of the litter or the surface of the of the cages, you know, in the floors. This is to start promoting that development of moisture in that area. Of course, for the layer, it's a little bit different. I'm going to, to talk about it at the last part of the presentation. But the goal in mind is basically the same, create an environment after the birds arrive to the hatchery, to the farm, sorry, so we can create a proper litter moisture in the farm. So all the practices that we do in the farm, like the partial brooding, like trying to concentrate a good relative humidity inside of the farm, we'll have as a main goal, have a good litter moisture level. So in one of these pictures, you're seeing, you're seeing a moisture meter basically measuring the, um, the percentage of humidity right there. You're reading at 28%. Checking the CO2 concentration, the temperature and the level of humidity in the air. So all those variables will help us to create a good environment to allow the, the coxie to sporulate and be active on the days that it needs to be recycled. So those farm practices are intended to achieve certain humidity levels in the litter, especially close to day seven. And after that, a couple of other weeks of so day 14, day 21, after we vaccinate them in the hatchery. So for most of the breeder farmers and layer farmers here, if you have coccidiosis vaccine from the hatchery, those birds arrive with the vaccine, with the vaccine already applied, 
and your work basically starts here. The goal again is the sporulation of the oocyst in the litter, so birds can eat them, and they will they will do it. They will eat some some levels of droppings, and revaccinate themselves. If you wanted to see it that way, that's what's going to happen. They are basically eating again the the oocyst that they ate seven days before that multiplicate inside of them, and they revaccinate themselves, and the cycle start over again. This process, again, takes several times to develop immunity. At some point, the bird will be able to control it by itself, no need for medications or additional interventions, and they will control the oocyst or the coxy population inside of them. So how long that it takes? Well, you have, as I said, different species of coxy. They are present in the vaccines. And it takes a specific amount of times per species to develop immunity. So in previous slides, I'll show you how these imerias or coccidia looks different of each other and how they populate different parts. So the immunity, immunity development is also different. You have here that for imeria cervolina or imeria mivati, it takes two or three weeks. For maxima itanella, around three to four weeks. And finally, with Imeria necatrix, four to five weeks. So that means that after your flock is vaccinated, there's a little bit of work on your side in the farm level to make this vaccine work successfully. One thing that sometimes you hear is, is week two or three, let's say, and you're having a break of coxy, and you might think, oh, uh, is the vaccine wasn't applied properly or the vaccine is not working. And you might be right on the application. That's something that someone like me do every now and then visiting hatcheries to validate that the vaccine is properly stored, properly mixed, properly applied. So producers can have the peace of mind that that step is taken care of. But there's also what happens after. And if you failed on controlling that process, the vaccine is not going to cycle properly. And what you are ended up is with a subclinical coxy and causing you further issues in your farm. If you see this, this graph, this picture is showing you basically the given cycles that you have in order to develop immunity. If you allow me to go back again, you need to keep in mind that that cycle will change depending on the species. And you need to have those five weeks in mind to work with. So if you think about a partial brooding and how a flock is growing, and then you're using a bigger area of your farm, this is also that you need to keep in mind, basically how my coxie is cycling during that process, how my coxie is cycling while I'm doing other changes in my diet, in my temperature or in my water intervention. So if you do manage this in the proper way without causing too much disruptions, the birds are going to spurulate more and more oocysts over time. And there will be a point that they develop a complete immunity. Again, I have to highlight that more than once. With a species like Necatrix or Brunetti, you have to Think about the first five weeks. When we do it in broilers, we usually think about the very first cycle at day seven, maybe the second one at day, around day 14. And then we don't worry about it anymore. And usually it controls by itself. The birds produce enough moisture in their droppings. So the leader has that condition and they are basically good to go. With breeders and layers, it's a little bit different because Again, because they live longer than, than five weeks, we have these imerias that can, can cause issues later on. And we basically want to create the proper immuni immunity development, even for those species, not only for the ones that are cycles at the very beginning. With that being said, the transition from the first flock to the second, from the first to the second cycle, sorry, 
is critical. So that's what happens around day seven after vaccination. The birds are going to start shedding the oocyst around those days. And what we have, what we want is to have the proper environment after they start shedding those oocysts. So they sporulate, the birds eat it again, and you have the second cycle going on. If you delay that cycle because your litter is dry, for instance, eventually it won't be it won't be that dry anymore. They will develop moisture and the cycle will continue. But if you delay that process, the impact of that cycling will be higher on your bird. So we really want to keep it tight. We want to keep it as earlier as we're showing in this slide. So by day 35, for instance, we're having almost all of these coxie cycling and developing immunity. A second cycle will sporulate. And by second, I mean after vaccination at the hatchery, if the moisture is, is there, so litter moisture around 25 to 35%, if I have a proper temperature in my litter, 26 to 30 degrees. How I do that? Well, like I said, have a good relative humidity in your farm give good access to feed and water to those animals so they release the sporocytes in the digestive tract. You have here some uh, information on density or the areas that you should use per bird. Um, this might change depending on the you know, location that we are. Like I said, Alberta is drier than Ontario, for instance, or other places in Canada or, or the world. You need to keep in mind is your your goals. If you are able to achieve a good litter litter moisture with a density a little bit higher than this or lower than this, that's what is important, and that's when you as a producer might know the answers better than the booklet or the bulletin. This is requires a little bit of work and discipline, but is achievable, and you will see that it's not as different as what um, management guide will recommend you. So disruption in the process of going from the first cycle to the second will cause that some birds start building immunity while others remain naive to coccidia. So those birds that remain naive to coccidia because the area where that bird was, was too dry or because it wasn't properly vaccinated at the hatchery, those are the ones that will disrupt later on with issues. So if you have birds that are naive to coccidia, you will have poor uniformity of immunity. That increases the risk of coccidiosis breaks. And those are the cases when you have a vaccinated flock that you might think, hey, I'm seeing these issues, I'm having mortality. Um, I think I need to do an intervention. And don't get me wrong, the interventions is something that if you discuss it with your veterinarian and decided to do it, you should you should do it because you don't want to pay the price of a mortality or a very uneven flock after. But it shouldn't be a consistent or a treatment that you should do every single flock. The treatments with products like Amprolium, which is the most common one, are not really recommended after proper vaccine application. So they should not be used as a routine treatment. It's something that you can use. It's something that is available. And it's great that it's available, that it's still available to be used, but it should be used wisely. And the reason why, and that's why I was mentioning about Necatrix and the first four to five weeks, is because if you use it earlier, let's say week three, you are affecting how that coxy is cycling. So Amiria, Necatrix, or Brunetti, can be affected if I put an, an intervention, if I put a medication, and the price you pay later in the future could be higher, right? So all of this requires that uh, your veterinarian is, is, is checking into the flock and making a good decision on what to do. Sometimes, and I have discussed this with our veterinarian within Merck Canada, you go to a farm, and you might see some bloody droppings in, in the litter. You see a little bit of mortality, so it's not something extreme. 
and without intervention, just by, let's say, opening the whole brooding area, for instance, because let's say the moisture levels are good enough or too high at some point, it controls by itself without medication. And that's because, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is a self-limiting disease. So once we provide conditions that are appropriate, the disease will slow down and you won't need to use a medication. So use wisely if you have to, is, is the message that I want to keep there. So you can develop proper immunity in all the species that are in the vaccine. So again, I, I want to highlight that I'm not, or when we ask for coxie management in a farm after vaccination, it's not like we are asking for things that are very out of place or very different of what's given on a management guide. So this is uh, from Aviagen, it's a checklist from for brooding equipment. So when we have our chicks, what's a uh, uh, genetic house like Aviagen recommending? So this is an example. Most of the management guides will have something similar, but you will see that litter temperature is what is recommended for coxie to cycle. The relative humidity is what is recommended so you can have also a good litter moisture so your litter doesn't dry out in the environment. You have the litter depth that is also recommended so you can have a good amount of litter that could hold moisture properly and you have the amount of drinkers as well for birds. So when you have that without thinking on coccidiosis vaccination but only on management, you are already working on what's required for proper coxie cycling. So work on, on that part, you know, the management guides have those recommendations and I acknowledge that for places like Alberta in Canada, it's a little bit difficult to achieve those 60 or 70% of relative humidity in a farm. I have been there, I have seen it, that is challenging. But even if you work on achieving a 65%, for instance, that's already something that will create a difference in how this vaccine cycle. So I mentioned OPGs before, and basically it's one of those tools that we as Merck use to really test what's happening in a, in a farm with a customer. If you have concerns in how your coccidiosis vaccine is cycling, or even if you have concerns on how your medication against coxie is, is, is doing, this is a good tool to evaluate that. Uh, these are real examples that I have taken over time. And it's basically to show you how it looks like when it's successful. Um, I don't have slides here to show you the opposite when it's not, but basically uh, this will give you an idea if you want to try OPGs to measure how coccidiosis is behaving in your farms. So you see basically a graph that starts with a lower level, reach a peak, and then goes down. You see three different colors right there, and it's basically to highlight different species of coxie. If I have evidence around day seven that I take the poop samples in my farm, and they turn out we have some numbers of oses, it means that my vaccination was probably successful. If I provide the proper conditions, in my farm, I will end up with successive life cycles that increase the number of oocysts in the environment. And that's basically the revaccination process that is going on. And after you reach a peak, what is suspected is that the immune system will do the rest and the amount of oocysts in your droppings go down. So this is no medication involved. It's basically the vaccination the work of the farmer to develop the proper moisture levels, opening the brooder guards at the right time, and then having the immunity, immunity development. This is a second example. So again, the evidence of host is early, giving the proper conditions, and you see that you have a cycle there. It doesn't look similar every single time. What is important beyond the numbers, you see that I'm not showing numbers of X per gram of uh, osis per gram here is the trends. So if I'm seeing this type of trend where I'm reaching a peak and then going down, that's telling me that the immunity is achieved for all species. 
So if you see on these graphs, there's a yellow color that starts later in the cycle. In this particular case, it's Imeria maxima. And what we want to see is that for all species, we're having the same trend, that basically the numbers are being reduced. That trend is telling you that you're doing the right thing. One of the main questions in this, these cases is, OK, I'm doing my best in my barn, but I have uh, cages. You know, if, if we jump into layers, uh, I have an aviary system. How do I work in developing those conditions so I can have this, right? So that's when you need to think about other alternatives. So if you, and I'm speaking to layer farmers, farmer mostly, if you have floors or if you have cages where you can put paper, you can recreate these conditions that I was talking about. It's a lot of work because you need to put the papers, split the papers or the or the droppings when you are splitting the flock in more cages. And that can be overwhelming sometimes and it can be challenging to make the cycle uh, work properly. So what do we do when those conditions are not there? Showing here a picture of a aviary system. Um, that's when we need to consider all the al alternatives. And to highlight some of the issues that we have with layers is that heat and moisture might not be appropriate in management systems for pullets, and the access to feces might also be difficult. So this is also back up by some articles that recognize that it's a different game with 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 cages or aviary system. The major challenge is really paper moisture buildup and management, which include keep the reading papers up to 30 days. That can be complicated. Move the papers with the feces on it. Increase the relative humidity in pullet facilities. So those are some of the challenges that you have in layers. Cage-free pullets and layer outbreaks are usually due to breakdowns in litter management, which override coccidial stats when we're using medication and gut health medication program. So even when we are not talking about vaccines, sometimes this phenomenon happens and you're having a, a flock that you're using a medication, usually works well, but you ended up having some issues with coxie and you might blame the medication, but it's also the way the parasite is cycling and if we are providing the conditions for it. So for long life birds, I'm showing just the vaccine that is part of our portfolio, but it, is, it applies with the vaccines that you have in the market, is that in, in some cases, we acknowledge that the conditions can be different. And I'm highlighting a little part here in the vaccination programs that is basically saying that many factors must be considered when determining the proper vaccination. Um, you need to administer that to healthy chickens. It says that the amount of protection required will vary with the type of operation. So that's when what I'm showing before. If I have floors, if I have cages, if I have an aviary system. And the degree of exposure that a flock is likely to encounter. So for those reasons, a program of periodic revaccination might be required. So what I have talked about before is basically doing the revaccination on the farm level and let the birds do it. We just provide the conditions. But in some cases, we need to consider a reapplication of the vaccine on the farm level because we uh, we don't have the conditions to recycle the vaccine properly. So the label actually acknowledge that I'd recommend uh, revaccination in some cases. So one of the things that it's been done in the industry and it's been tried here already successfully, we are trying to expand that, but we have learned from the US initially from this is the trickle dose of the coccidiosis vaccination. So besides the hatchery application, is a second or third application of the vaccine sprayed directly on feed. So basically we use a backpack sprayer, we put it in the feed line and we try to spray all the feed that the birds will, will eat in any given part of the day. The trickle vaccination that is being tried in the US is basically a second coxie vaccination, but split it 
in three. So one third of the dose at day seven, 14 and 21. And this is basically to recreate, to mimic the fecal cycling. So instead of the work that we mentioned on the liter moisture and the relative humidity and so on, we're basically applying the vaccine ourselves and reducing the amount of extra work that we're doing on the farm level. So basically you just do some work on the first week and after day seven or nine, you are removing the papers, the plates, whatever you have there to collect droppings and allow recycling. So with this application, we are basically recreating what happened normally in the farm. The dilution rate should be based on a complete coverage of feed lines. So basically what I have recommending to producers that have tried this is that you go there one day and just use some distilled water and do a trial run. Basically evaluate the amount of water that you need to use to cover all the lines and dilute that third of vaccine in your facility. A proper application will only dampen the surface of the feet. We don't want to have a wet feet, it's just the surface. And if you, because you guys know your birds, you will see that probably when they see a change of color appearance on feet, like adding water on it, they will eat it really quick. The use of diet is recommended on these cases, so it's easier for you guys to track that. This is an example of how trickle dose vaccination looks like. So also keep in mind the trend, the numbers or the way the graph looks might change, but look for a, at the beginning, a peak, not decrease. So day seven, again, is evidence of successful vaccination on hatchery level. Now we have the effect of the hatchery application plus the application in, in the farm. Again, another evidence that is a cumulative effect. So effect of the hatchery application plus the two thirds that are applied and eventually an immunity development caused by the trickle dose, including the vaccination at day 21. So this is recreate what happens if you have the proper conditions for the vaccine to cycle. This time you are doing it yourself by applying a second dose split it in three parts. So the results of this type of vaccination has shown protection on vaccinated birds. It's been successful in the US in all type of bullet facilities. So some people even in floors are trying that as well. Uh, it's an investment, yes, because you're applying the vaccine again, but the savings comes from a lower mortality and better overall status of your flock health. So again, working in better uniformity in your flock and eventually better performance. So this is almost the end of the presentation. So the key points for you to keep in mind, and I'm showing a couple of pictures there that don't look pleasant, but it's an important summary of what we're discussing here. Watch your flocks, right? Uh, this is a picture of how normal feces look like. Um, doing that exercise, if you are doing OPGs or if you are just walking your flock, it's a really good tool to understand what's going on on the intestine, if it's healthy or not caused by coxie or any other uh, challenge. That's my main main key point. Keep an eye on the poop. Implement actions to favor humidity and moisture in the farm. So this is a message, again, specifically, or most importantly on areas in the world where you have lower humidity in the environment. Pursue opti optimal brooding practices. So again, it's not far from what a genetic company will recommend. This will create proper osis cycling and avoid litter perkers. Those could be a big problem. Litter moisture measurements should be considered. So if you have a moisture meter, it will be great to start. Eventually you will be able to recognize the proper litter moisture after you walk your barn and see how your boots look like or just to grab an amount of litter and check it with your hands. If it crumbles, slowly it's in the right condition. A good starting point st still is to get a little moisture meter. Manage the brooding. 
based not only on density, water, and feed, but also on shedding, sporulation, and ingestion of the parasite. So it's a dual component. You shouldn't leave or, or sacrifice one for the sake of the other. It's working together, considering those variables in how fast you are opening your farm and achieving those proper moisture levels in the litter. Both males and females will benefit from the same coxie management for the first three to four weeks. Sometimes you see that the partial brooding is being applied on the females and it works. People work hard on that, but they forget the males and males are 50% of the, of the facility of the production with the breeders. So same management will benefit them both. Consider progressive and smooth changes on your program. So again, if we are doing changes on diets, changes on lighting programs uh, or feed restriction programs, consider also how coxie cycles and try to avoid that those events happen at the same time. So that's basically reducing the stress on those birds because they can't perceive them. So if we can create a program that it doesn't go at the same time as the way coxie is cycling, it will really help. OPGs. So if you are not doing it and you have concerns about coxie, why not? If you are using medication, discuss that with your feed rep. If you are using vaccination, you can discuss that with your vet or directly with someone like me. And we can create data and information that will help you to make good decisions. Watch again. So watch the droppings, the behavior, the mortality, the uniformity of your flock. The treatments and interventions should be evaluated with your veterinary. And lastly, adapt these principles to your barn. Every farm and facility is different. And a message that I always deliver is, you know better than anyone else, your facility. You know your barns, you know your equipment. You are the person who can make the best decisions for your barn. Someone like me is, uh, someone that can provide tools and ideas from the outside, adapt those wisely to your barn. These are a couple of documents that are available in the internet. One is from Merck, another one is from Avigent. Summarizes some of what I discuss here also. And if you have people to discuss this with, this is a really good starting point to have those files and chat about them. So with that being said, I want to say thank you to everyone in the audience to PIP for the opportunity to talk about this. I'll be happy to discuss any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Great presentation, Felipe. Thank you so much. Um, as I predicted at the beginning, uh, before you started, I thought there might be lots of questions and I was, I was correct. So there are a few waiting in the queue for us. I remind folks, if you uh, would kindly put your questions in the Q&A box uh, rather than in the chat box, uh, that will help us find them. Um, and I won't be poking around trying to look for them. Um, so let's just get started uh, with some of the questions. You know, for me, what I've learned is uh, from your talk, especially is that, uh, as you said, every farm is unique. Every farm has unique conditions and every flock has unique conditions. And what I what I took from your presentation that there are some things that we can do by a recipe, but then there's a lot of observation and judgment that needs to happen with every flock. And so it, we can't just set it and forget it, but we really need to be paying attention uh, to the details. Mm -hmm. So let's start with a, a couple of the questions here. One is, uh, what is your take on the use of attenuated vaccines in our dry Alberta environment? Well, um, I think we, if you try a vaccine like it's attenuated, um, we are already playing with the variable. And I think the question is having part of the answer already. And is an attenuated vaccine enough for cycling our conditions? If you can create the proper ones, I think you could try it. Uh, you know, we have the uh, an attenuated vaccine available and I, I don't have enough information to tell you how successful it is, but it's, uh, it's there in the market. I would say that if you are able to create the conditions, 
you can try it for sure. But uh, keeping in mind what I mentioned on the presentation, so try to be able to measure what's going on if you use any given vaccine, not only an attenuated one, and evaluate what you're seeing on your barn. If it's your, if the conditions are proper, and by measuring, by backing up with science, you are able to see that it's doing the job. Uh, great, but uh, I would say it could be more challenging for the conditions we are. Yeah, managing the, those conditions are are uh, are a challenge here in Alberta for sure, but something to strive towards. Uh, another question. Um, a little bit different. Uh, do you have a study or can you share your thoughts on the coxie cycle effect of two flocks of broiler breeders with coxie vac vaccination at day age, so spray, one with a short shipping, two hours of shipping time, and the other with a long shipping stress around 30 hours? Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I do not have a study at hand, but you know, if you consider the, the main principles that we discussed today here, plus what we know when a bird is delayed on having feed intake or water intake, is that uh, first of all, you have a bird that is challenged before arrived to your barn. So that's already something to consider. And what are the steps that you need to take in order to provide better conditions to those birds once they arrive to your barn? So a bird that uh, fast that long already has challenges in their intestinal health. And probably on future presentations, we'll see something like that. That's why it is always crucial what we do in our first 24 hours in the barn. The second part of that question is, keep in mind that once your bird arrive, the day seven or day seven of the cycle of the coxie is not day seven at the barn. It's a day and a half before or so. so are you able to create the conditions at that point for the COXI to cycle properly? Because we we usually think about our placement as day zero and then count from, from, from there. And if you're thinking about COXI, that vaccine was applied, like you said, 36 hours ago or even more in a hatchery. So that's also something to consider when you are receiving those birds. What is important if it's a, a long wait like sometimes we experience with our placements with breeders or layers, access to feed and water is the most important one, not only for coxie cycling, but for general health of those birds. But keep in mind that the timing will change too, the timing for yeah. cycling. I think that's a really good point. You're right. Most of us think about day zero is when they arrive at the farm, but it could have been a day and a half pushing two days uh, earlier. Um, when, when they were vaccinated. So very good point. Um, another question here. Uh, if you do not recommend chemical treatment or ampral uh, after coxie vaccination, what do you suggest for helping in the case of a heterogeneous uh, coxie immunity flock? Uh, plant extracts such as saponins or saponins and essential oils based on additives? Question mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there's... There's articles, and I, I cite a couple in my presentation that confirms that some of these products will help, the alternative ones. So uh, there's a proven effect of saponins in the way coxie cycles. And Joka extract is, is one of those uh, natural products that are being used. There's another plant, I don't remember the name now. And then you have all these other extracts like oregano, for instance, uh, I had some experience with farmers here in Alberta trying oregano, um, even on early ages. That is not the general recommendation to use it very early because it can disrupt the cycle. But even in those cases, we see successful OPGs curves. So, and in general, from the anecdotally experience that the from the farmers, they would say that it works. So. There's backup in, in science, you know, articles that confirms that it helped. There's the experience of, of people. I will suggest you just to, based on those things, try it if you want to, but not all of them will work. That's that's all I can say. Um, you have to try them and see if, if, if it works for your facility. Um, in the market, there's all other, 
other white of products like um, red pepper extract, uh, garlic extract, uh, that are even used on human health nowadays that claim that could help you to not directly work with coccidiosis, but to preserve intestinal health. So is 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 something that we could try and for uh, for some reason they are available in the industry now. Yeah, it sounds like it might be an area of further research. I know there's already research going on in this area. There's a comment here that says, uh, I've seen in the years past that essential oils used in feed at uh, starters uh, in the first week can kill turkey coxie vaccinations and we get no cycling. Is the same perhaps something that could impact your vaccine? Yeah, so like I was saying, uh, with some a personal experience with oregano, for instance, uh, it's there's papers that says that if you use it earlier than day seven, for instance, you can disrupt the cycling of the vaccine. Anecdotally, I saw that in that particular case, it did not, you know, a producer used it earlier, but the recommendation is that if you are using these products that have a proven effect on the coxie cycling, they should be using an intended timing and not, let's say, the whole, the whole cycle or from day one. Yeah, timing is everything. Uh, and so we, we need to be, you know, this is a point that's coming out, popping out to me even more importantly. We've always talked about cycling and, and the timing and that kind of stuff. But that point is important when you think about the shipping, uh, you know, the transportation of birds, again, the timing, uh, the application of uh, other uh, treatments, again, timing. So timing matters. It's kind of like real estate, location, location, location. This one is timing, 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 you know, so good point. Um, right. uh, question here, you talked about trickle dosing uh, for layers. And the question is, can we do this in broilers? And if not, why not? Well, broilers are shorter cycles, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, and the focus that we have on, on broiler chickens, even the vaccine is different. Uh, from from Merck or other pharmaceutical companies, that same principle will apply. They are not the same vaccines. There's not the same species that we focus on coxie because broilers do live shorter times. So, in theory, you could do it, but the investment, I would I would say, is not necessary. And with broilers, is easier to manage because you know you have a bird that is growing a lot faster than a breeder or a layer. Is producing more droppings, more humidity, a lot faster. Uh, I would say it's, uh, it's not it's not necessary. You know, it's uh, if you think about other long life birds besides layers. If I think about breeders, there might be a point, and I, I highlight that some some layers in the U.S. are using it even in floors, uh, so they avoid that extra amount of work that that you need to do to achieve good cycling broilers might not be the case to try that if you ask me and based also on my personal experience not only in the backup of science uh, I saw it here in Alberta working successfully and without the need of either extra vaccination or medication right right um you know you talked about all the extra work that we need to do especially to get the right conditions with layers have you tried trickle feeding here in Alberta? Have you seen that worked appropriately? Yes. And, you know, I, I need to acknowledge that it's a, a teamwork, not only yeah. within Merck, but also with the customers and the people that work with customers. Uh, it's a, a join, joining forces to, to try something like that. And yes, we have tried successfully. And I, I know that there are several farmers with aviary systems here in Alberta that are trying it that way and with good experiences on it. Okay, that's good to know. Um, question here, what is the lowest OPG count that is required for immunity? And conversely, what is the high limit where the damage done is not too much? Um, and what would you say is a good OPG count for three cycles in broilers? Okay. So it's a good question because it's allow me to, to highlight something that is important for a producer to know. Yes, there are some crazy numbers sometimes when you do check OPGs. And you probably check that at the same day that you're having mortality caused by Imeria Tenella. So let's say 500,000. But in the same case, I can make a sample on a healthy looking flock and found those same numbers. 
So don't follow the numbers. And that's why I didn't put any on the graphs. Look for the trends. So if you see that a curve is behaving, you know, and you have really high peaks after a low number at the beginning, keep keep that in mind. If measure that and see what's happening in reality and follow the trends. Try to pursue looking for a peak that eventually drops down by itself. That speaks a lot more than numbers itself. So unfortunately, I, I won't give one because at the end of the day, what you are looking for is the trend. So labs will measure and they have thresholds. So when, when you talk about the minimums, that can change between labs. So there are some labs that start with 10,000 and sometimes they show zero because their threshold is 10,000 OCs per gram. There's some other labs that will give you 300. So depending on how they measure the number of OCs per gram, you will give that. Basically what we look on OPGs on day seven when we start taking the samples is evidence rather than a number that those OCs are present in, a, in the dropping. So that means that a vaccine was applied seven days ago and those birds are shedding them in the environment. Good. Good. I, I, think, I think that helps because sometimes we get stuck on the numbers and uh, it's the trends really that you've said it a few times now. It's really that trend that, uh, you know, evidence peak and then that drop off that really that's what we need to be looking for. So yeah, I um, if, if, if I can add something about on that is uh, basically create data, create information on your facilities. How it doesn't have to be every single flock, but you create the history on how this look on a winter flock. How does this look like during my summertime? If I'm doing a combination program, how this look after four flocks using medication and before vaccination, because there's several ways to manage this. Uh, some programs have that, you know, you use medication between winter and spring, during the summer, introduce the vaccines, and then you go back to, to medication. And it's always good to measure how that looking like to see if um, my decisions are appropriate and accordingly to what I'm seeing the realities. So try to create that. It's a very good first step if you don't, if you don't have it. I think it's a it's a really good point, and we could use it for so many things on the farm. But it's not just the flock in front of you; um, it's the it's the history uh, on the farm that can teach you so much. And if you can keep those records and keep that data and use it to inform you, um, and it'll help you make better decisions going forward. So I appreciate that so much. Um, next question here. Um, so in layers, would you recommend doing uh, vaccination at the hatchery and then again in the pullet house at 7, 14, and 21 days? <laughs> well, more than recommending it is that if you are a layer farmer that are experiencing challenges with coccidiosis, either if it's medication or you are trying the vaccination, if you acknowledge that distributing papers during 30 days is complicated that you don't have the staff of the time to do it properly. You might consider this as an alternative. And by that, I mean the vaccine will do the work if you if you try to do all these practices that I mentioned today. But uh, I acknowledge from the experiences of farmers themselves that sometimes it's just too hard. And if you have an aviary system, it can be almost impossible to do it. So if you have those scenarios and maybe medication is not working as you were expecting to, a vaccination with a trickle vaccination in the farm might be the choice for you to consider. So there's not always a single solution and I want to be clear on that. And you know, for me, it will be easier to do, say, yeah, just use vaccines, but just picture your scenario. Think if you are a farmer with a challenging scenario with coxie and if maybe a trickle vaccination is a solution for you. If it, that's the case, based on the experience in the United States and even from farmers in here, it might be your solution to, to tackle coxie in your farm. Great. You know, this that question did come from an aviary farmer. Um, and then another joined in and said that they've done it and they've had very good results. 
my question is, is the 7, 14, and 21 necessary? Like, again, you think about the cycling and that kind of stuff. Do you have to do all three? How do you know when to stop? Yeah, good question. So basically with that scenario of splitting the vaccine in three, you are trying to recreate all the efforts that you would do if you don't vaccinate again and just do management, right? After the 21 days, there's still coxycycline, but usually it will cycle by itself. So it is the level of effort is lower. And that's why you are we are recommending this split in three and just an additional vaccination. So if you think you are just vaccinating twice, you know, the whole doses, it's just that you split the second one in three parts. Other option could be just to do a single vaccination in the in in the farm level. But still, we are if we are on challenging conditions, that cycle on day 21 or after, it could be also a challenge if I'm just doing an additional vaccine and my issues will show up probably again. So that that's why this, this, this was designed this way to basically recreate how the parasite is cycling when you are doing your practices. Yeah, yeah it's kind of an artificial cycling when, when it, the conditions aren't great, right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, okay, we have, there are a few more questions. It is 11.09. I'm just gonna check with you, Felipe. Do you have time to to continue on with the questions or should, should we yeah. send them to you later and we can answer them? Yeah, you know, depending on the amount, if if anyone has a specific question, either through you or di directly through me, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, okay. Let me do just a couple more questions here. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand and this question, but that's maybe because I don't fully understand this topic area. So maybe you will. Can you comment on the relationship between Coxivac B52 and high SDS birds? I'm not sure what SDS means that are quite noticeable and then drops to 25% that total as soon as immunity is achieved. 25% of the total. What does yeah. SDS mean? Yeah, if the person asking the question can clarify that would be helpful. I'm, I'm okay, not sure. That, okay, that would be great. So, George, if you wouldn't mind popping back on here and adding a little more clarity that to that question, that would be super. Let's move on to the next question. Is the coxie vaccination at the hatchery necessary or recommended for a cage layer bird or more so for a floor bird where they have access to their litter? Okay, so again, basically, Vaccination is part of the toolbox. Medication and especially combination nowadays is what you know science is claiming that is one of the ways that being able to keep using the products that are available in our market successfully, you know, and medicate your birds. Uh, I'm not against that. Vaccination is an alternative when maybe that's not a solution for you when regulation is not allowing you to use those products. And that's why vaccination has expanded to very big levels nowadays. Because if you think about Europe, for instance, there's more restrictions than what we have here. We might face those restrictions at some point too. You no, know, there's with antibiotics mostly, but with the products that we use for coxie, it could happen also. So you have the resistance and the regulations as potential limitations. And that's when the vaccination could be a, an alternative. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that for some of the audience, they are doing this work with only medication and they feel like it's successful. And if it is, it's, it's, it's great to know. But in some cases it's not, and you jump to vaccination and realize that maybe you can control it better then the investment can be lower, you know, that when you do medication and what you get in return could be better because you're basically, creating a bird that is capable to face and tackle the parasite by itself rather than, you know, giving the extra help with the medication. And in some cases, when you do exercises like OPGs and you are medicating your birds and you think that good things are going straight and then you realize that maybe it's not what you were expecting, uh, you know that you have this alternative. So that's the way I will answer that question. It's, it's not like a must. And like it's better, but it's an alternative that could be considered 
and could be give you better return. Great, for sure. It's to balance all of those things, the effort, the investment, the the return, all of those things. So um, a question here about, can you comment about uh, feeding whole wheat to control coxie? To control it? Okay, well, um, maybe I don't have all the knowledge to answer that question. Um, whole wheat has some anti-nutritional factors uh, and actually the inclusion of whole wheat in diets could increase the risk of necrotic enteritis, for instance, for that same reason. If I have a relationship, a direct relationship with COXI, uh, I don't have an answer, but basically knowing that it's affecting the microbiota and the status in the gut health and can lead into a necrotic enteritis issue, uh, I would say is rather than helping, it could be part of a, a challenge in how the coxie is cycling. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to answer it with the best of my knowledge. Okay, I appreciate that. You know, there's uh, quite a few questions here about managing litter moisture. Uh, so you talked about litter moisture, at least try to achieve about 25%, you know, start yes. somewhere. Um, and so the question is, is that at, on average, is that consistently across the, the, the barn? Other questions about, can we get too far with um, with our litter? Can, it, can our litter be too wet? Um, and then what do you recommend um, about releasing the brothers from the, the brooding pen? So just in general, a lot of questions about managing that moisture litter, maybe you can comment. Yeah, no, for sure. On, on, on my current position or my previous position, in my previous job, I, I saw that happening for sure, that you go too far, you push too hard. You know, you, you walk your barn and the litter moisture is on, on the 50s instead mm -hmm. of 25%. Uh, yeah, that will create disruptions too. So in those cases, you know, let's say you visit a farm and you see that scenario by day six or seven, instead of holding the birds till day nine, you just open the brooder guards and let them go and try to create the conditions for the second cycle. This this is certainly a matter of balance, you know, like a lot of things in life or in working in the industry. And yeah, that's why there's this recommendation of 25% minimum because we're working with animals and they move from one place to other. There's other variables like ventilation, temperature that could affect where they are spending their time you might have unevenness in the litter. So we cannot be as strict to say it needs to be 25% all over the place of the brooding area. But at the same time, you need to be careful that you don't have a flock that is spending most of the time on one side of the partial brooding and having the other area completely dry because coxie won't be the only issue by then. You know, you have unevenness in how they're reaching the food, the feed and the water. Uh, how the litter is behaving in one side or the other. So the idea of measuring it, yes, just trying to look some evenness on it, but you, you will see some variation for sure. So if your average, let's say somewhere around 25, 35%, is telling you that you have good conditions for sporulation, but at the same time, beyond the variable, you need to check that your flock is evenly distributed for the rest of the variables for how well they are behaving and gaining weight, drinking water and all of that. Yeah. yeah, it's not one thing at a time ever, right? It's always so multifactorial. And and if you aren't quite achieving those things, it's, it's to look around and say, well, what's going on here? Not just say, <laughs> that's one, a bad one, spot. No, what, what's going on? What, why is one, this, why is this happening? One thing we recommend, Val, when, when we start doing that was to try to walk the barn on a zigzag pattern and and basically either with the moisture meter or with your own experience with your boots or your hands just checking how that litter looks like across the the brooding area so yeah. if you measure that that way and and you are able to control it um you will open the proper days and allow the, the coxie to cycle the right way and providing the brooding management practices at the same time. Yeah, the power of observation, it's huge. Uh, just, I wanna clear up a couple of things and then I'm gonna let you go. 
Um, regarding the uh, trickle feeding for layers, uh, just a, a point here that uh, it really is a one third dose, not three full doses. Uh, so just wanted to, to make sure that, that people heard that when you were talking 7, 14 and 21 days, those are one third doses and not full doses. And then a, a comment about, can you uh, explain what attenuated means? Yeah, cox coccidiosis is basically a, a, a parasite that as you saw, maybe I can go back a little bit. As you saw on, on one of the graphs, it has a cycle. Right. Yep. Yeah, you um, want to share because we're not yeah. sharing right now. Oh. So there we go. not an expert on, on, on that part, but basically Coxie has a cycle and you see that there's some reinfective cycles on this graph. So there's some cases that we're taking OSIS for vaccination that don't have the reinfective cycles going on. So basically it's a shorter cycle and we are taking those oses and we are using it in the vaccines. So what it's claim is that the effect or the damage that are causing is, is lower than a non-attenuated vaccine. Um, I don't have the full answer for it, but that's a part of one of what it is. And with that level of attenuation, the, the cycle might be lower than what it is normally. So on one side, the vaccine is not creating too much disruption, which is good, right? The level of damage that the parasite in the vaccine is causing is lower, but the downside of it is how fast you are developing immunity. So again, we have to play with that balance between what's the best choice for your, for your facility, for your farm, and that's what it's involved when you are using an attenuated vaccine, even if you're discussing about uh, other type of vaccines like viral ones. If you have attenuation, the level of reaction is lower for sure, but, but at the same time, how you're triggering the immune system to develop immunity could be challenged as well. So it might work, it will work. And it, for some reason, for, for a good reason, those vaccines are available. Uh, we do have attenuated vaccines too in other parts of the world, but it needs to fit the necessity of the, of the place. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, Felipe, we have we have put you through your paces. Boy, I bet you're gonna have a good lunch and uh, take a breath after this. Um, so much information, so many questions around this area because it's so important. So I appreciate you coming today. Um, and working through those questions and giving us a great presentation, lots to understand there. And